So this is the third section out of four in chapter 19, and this is National Unification and the Nation State. Uh, this section is basically about the rise of the forces kind of unleashed by the revolutions of 1848 and the French Revolution, and their ultimate dominance on the European stage. In particular, the nations of the United States, Great Britain, and Canada, as well as Austria and Russia, which I don't include in the focus questions, have major reforms of their society that make them more of national and liberal states, where Italy and Germany become nations for the first time. In the case of Italy and Germany, liberalism does not get baked into the picture as much, but still it's because of the forces from the French Revolution. So here is a time-lapse image of the expansion of the Kingdom of Sardinia, Piedmont, which is this brown country in the upper left-hand corner, into eventually the Italian state. So. Austria had divided Italy uh, deliberately in order to prevent France from getting too much power because the Kingdom of Sardinia Piedmont was traditionally a French ally. And very long story short, that we'll get into later in the lecture, the military successes of the Kingdom of Sardinia, as well as that of nationalist rebels in the south of the country, in the future country, end up creating a unified Italian state where there hadn't been one since the Roman Empire, frankly, or the Holy Roman Empire sometime after that. Um, the Pope in the middle of the country, or the future country, he is the most resistant to the idea of Italian nationalism, and the Papal State actually does not get dissolved until the unification of Germany in the Franco-Prussian War. Oops. Sorry. Yeah, at the Franco-Prussian War, you get Austria knocked off its pedestal, and Rome becomes the capital of Italy in 1871. The Pope is in the Vatican, that's it. The other big nation, most important probably part of this section, is the unification of Germany into what is called a Klein Deutschland. The image on the left is what would be called a Gross Deutschland. Klein means little, Gross means big. And the kingdom of Germany, I'm sorry, the kingdoms of Germany, the little Germanies, if they had all been combined together, would have included everything within this dark red line, including uh, many areas that are now independent other nations, like Bohemia is now the Czech Republic, for example. Uh, the kind of seed crystal, or the this grain of sand that becomes the pearl that is Germany, is the nation of Prussia, which again has been joked to be joked. I mean, it's kind of seriously said to be a nation, a military with a nation rather than a nation with a military. I, um, the bottom right-hand image is the North German Confederation, that's the red. So Germ Prussia beats Austria in a war, they get all the North German states on their side, then uh, German, Prussia beats uh, France in a war, and they get the south of modern-day Germany. This is an ethnographic map, meaning a map showing the different nationalities. You've got Oberdeutsch and Niederdeutsch, which basically the north of Germany is lower Germans, meaning the geography is lower. It's a different dialect. In a lot of ways, you could argue it's a different language. And in the south, you've got the upper Germans, so the Austrians, Bavarians, etc. Uh, you may note that the Netherlands actually has a language that is labeled as Lower Deutsch, meaning, you know, there are some German nationalists who wanted to make the Netherlands part of their country, or Scandinavia, because of, you know, uh, shared Germanic heritage. One of the key impetuses to the breakdown of the concert of Europe was the Crimean War. And so the Crimean War occurs when the Russian Empire invades the uh, Turkishly controlled territories of Moldova and Wallachia, which are Romanian speaking and Orthodox Christian. So Russia is trying to annex, as they did, the territory of Bessarabia, which is originally part of Moldova, um, basically Orthodox Christian territory. So it's not a nationalistic attempt to acquire territory, it's a religiously oriented, closer to that of the Thirty Years' War. Austria is supposed to be Russia's ally. They don't want to see, and the two countries had been keeping the status quo in Europe for the entire Concert of Europe period. So Russia and Austria make the Concert of Europe happen, and they want to prevent the expansion of nation states. Russia's invasion of the Ottomans, uh, basically, the Romanians that declined from the superpower of Europe to nearly a great power, and by the time of World War I, they're called the sick man of Europe. Perhaps unfairly, to be honest. Um, this is the, the Crimean War. It takes place mostly not in Moldova and Wallachia, but in Russia itself in the Crimean Peninsula. And long story short, 
kind of like Napoleonic Wars, all the other countries of Europe team up against the Russians, and it's a war with machine gun use, it's brutal, um, and there are many, many, many people that die, and it basically says, well, I guess the war Europe is going to become a continent of armed camps rather than a continent in concert with each other. So the principle of intervention is gone because of Austria's betrayal, quotes, of Russia. This is an image of the British soldiers in the charge of the Light Brigade. There's a poem about it, which is going to be on the next slide. Um, oh, I'm sorry. It's actually, if you click on the image, it's in the video. And it's the, the takeaway is, theirs is not to reason why, theirs is but to do or die. And that was seen as a good thing. Don't think about what's going on. Just go die for your country. And this is kind of the attitude, not kind of, this is the attitude of militarism that helps lead to the First World War and the atrocious ca uh, casualties in that war. These soldiers, there's 300 of them, they all die more or less because they charge into machine gun fire. Unification of Italy takes place basically, again, as Sardinia Piemont, with the help of France, after the Crimean War, is ready to upset the status quo. They're very, uh, the revolutions of 1848 are crushed by Austria, um, so the Venetians and the Lombardi, the people in the Lombardi, so northeast Italy, are not able to get free from Austria. And the kingdom in the northwest of Italy, again, Sardinia Piemont, gets a brand new prime minister who is kind of a genius. One thing that you're going to notice in this section is you get these political leaders who do the work of monarchs for them, but aren't monarchs themselves. So it's the beginning of the end of absolutism, if you know, there was even a chance of that continuing. No one believed in divine right of kings, really, in the 19th century, except for the one exception we'll see later. So the, um, the first president of the Second Republic of France, and now is a dictator, his name is Napoleon III, he teams up with Cavour. They basically swap territory. The green territory up top is the province of Piedmont, which is where the future Italian royal family is from. They give up their ancestral homelands to France in order to get help in unifying the rest of Italy into a national country. Again, a country unified by a language. Um, so basically, the team of Piedmont, Sardinia Piedmont in France provokes a war with Austria and Lombardy, which is where the richest city in Italy, Milan, is, um, is annexed to um, the kingdom of Sardinia Piedmont. The southern, the kind of central Italian cities of uh, Parma, Modena, and Tuscany, so where Florence is, the richest areas of the country, all join up with this emerging Italian state and make Sardinia Piemont much, much stronger than it would have been otherwise. Next comes Southern Italian patriots. And so these are kind of just folks that are, you know, so you have the top level diplomacy creating Italy, and then this is Giuseppe Gar Garibaldi. And here are his red shirts, which are his nationalist warriors. It's called he goes on a, um, a military expedition called the Expedition of a Thousand, and he beats the kingdom of the two Sicilies armies who are trying to, res they're basically French allied. So France wants Italy to be divided between strong states that can balance Austria. These nationalists say, well, that's not enough. We're going to topple the states that are allied with France and join them with Italy. Um, so Garibaldi basically beats the kingdom of the two Sicilies, which controls both the island of Sicily and the mainland of southern Italy, and then gives that to King Victor Emmanuel of Sardinia Piedmont. And now we can finally say the kingdom of Italy exists because on March 17, 1861, he's proclaimed the first king of Italy. So Venetia is annexed during the Frank austro prussian War. Um, Italy backs Prussia against Austria, which is not a surprise because they've been fighting Austria forever. And then in the Franco-Prussian War, Prussia again helps the creation of the uh, state of Italy to happen by invading France and causing the French to remove the troops they had in the center of Italy to protect the Pope. The Italian capital becomes uh, Rome on September 20th, 1870, and the Pope writes a bunch of letters complaining about it, but he can't do anything because he no longer has an army. So 1870 is the last time the Pope was the commander-in-chief of a military. In the end, again, nationalism is about people of the same culture being in the same country. And according to Italian nationalists, there are areas of Italy that are unredeemed. And this is called the Irredentia. And this is going to become one of the causes of the First World War, is the Italian Irredentia. And similar to the, to the, 
the rise of fascism in the 1920s and 30s in Italy is because these dotted green territories are not part of Italy. This actually, this is a map from post-World War I. So this is actually a, the map the fascists would have looked like. But there's a couple territories that are added to Italy after World War I that were uh, desired before it. The gentleman in the picture is Otto von Bismarck. The uh, German, Germany could have unified as a liberal, meaning one that protects human rights as a constitution nation, if Frankfurt Assembly in 1848's revolution had succeeded. Austria and Prussia, they teamed up, they smashed that, you know, parliament of professors, as it was kind of disparagingly called sometimes. Prussia is a military state, and it's authoritarian, it's military, it's militarism is the order of the day. And but nonetheless, German nationalists who looked at the failure of liberal democracy in Germany, think maybe a strong hand can be the way we get a unified Germany. They knew Austria wouldn't do it because it contained too many ethnic minorities and it was explicitly anti-nationalist. They didn't want nationalism to be successful. And they figured, hey, you know, we get an authoritarian Germany. There's no way that could have any negative consequences. We'll be able to liberalize it over time. They were right. It just took the Second World War to make that happen and the dream of a liberal Germany to exist. Um, and again, I just want to note that liberal in this context means human rights. It doesn't, we're not talking about the, you know, modern day political context, at least not directly. Um, so Otto von Bismarck, he's again, kind of like a war in Italy is largely responsible for the unification of the country. Uh, he's appointed by King Wilhelm basically to solve an issue where, oh, well, you know, the Prussian legislature doesn't want to pay for yet another expansion of the military. And so he just governs the country and makes that happen. He collects taxes using the army and basically laughs at parliament. It's called the Landtag, by the way. So the first excuse that Mr. Bismarck uh, has to try to kind of expand Prussia's power, Prussia's power. So you can see after the end of the revolutions of 1848, this light color is the state of Prussia uh, within the future borders of modern day of uh, Germany. The red area is the territory of Schwilistik Holstein, which is super, super confusing and Europey. And what I'm going to basically tell you, Denmark has it. Germany wants it. Austria also wants it to come away from Denmark, which is interesting. Um, and we'll see the consequences of that in a second. So there, the Schwilistik Holstein question basically has two stages. There's two wars. The first one, Austria and Prussia go beat up Schwelstein Holstein. The German Confederation votes in 1863 on von Bismarck's orders, or, you know, basically marching orders, and Austria feels compelled to go patriotically help out their fellow Germans in freeing Schwelstein and Holstein from Denmark. I didn't mention this on the last side. You this map on the left. The blue are Germans, the pink are um, Danes, and the yellow are this group called Frisians, who are basically Germans. So the territory is divided roughly equally between Germans and um, Danes. Immediately after getting Austria's help, Prussia betrays them, fights another war, and fully takes over schleswig holstein By doing so, they basically ensured that Austria would no longer be part of the German Confederation. And that meant that Austria would not be included in a future German state. You can see this on the map today because there is now a nation known as Austria and there's a nation now known as Germany. And they speak the same language. They have the same history. There was the reason they're not politically united is political. It's not because of national identity. Um, Bismarck loves to say the great questions of the day are decided by iron and blood because he thought that made him seem you know, righteous as opposed to just brutal. Um, and it's also called real politic, the art of the possible, basically. And so Bismarck's, you know, basically his political philosophy that has become very popular is it doesn't matter if you're right or wrong, doesn't matter what promises you made. If you get what you want, you get what you want. And so the result of these wars with uh, Denmark and Austria is that Prussia expands to this red territory and consolidates into what they call the North German Federation. The countries in the south are part of something called the South German Federation, allied with Austria. So you've got a north versus south divide in Germany. The little light territory in the corner is Alsace-Lorraine, which you probably remember. Oh, yeah. 
The British statement, Lord Palmerston reported it, said, only three people have ever really understood the Schlosting Holstein business. The Prince Consort, referring to um, that of Schlosting Holstein, who's dead, a German professor who's gone mad, and I, who have forgotten all about it. So again, don't sweat it. Just know that Bismarck uses power to unify Germany and nationalism to beat up Austria. So this is an image of Prussian troops in the French capital of Paris. So again, long story short, Bismarck pretends he cares about who's king of Spain. He doesn't. He just wants an excuse to uh, for war with France. And by getting a war with France in 1870 and winning it, the southern German states get whipped up into this nationalistic frenzy and they join with Alsace, with Lorraine, which are taken from France, and the North German uh, Federation, Confederation, sorry, to become the uh, Second Reich or the German Empire. This new country of Germany has a, an economy that is this equal, if not better, in some ways to Great Britain, and it is an absolute upset to the concept of Europe post Napoleon status quo. It is, it's a world changing event to have a united Germany that is powerful in the center of Europe, Mittel Europa, if, if you will. So Great Britain, very different story. Great Britain avoids revolution, it avoids upheaval, and she's frankly considered to be kind of an ideal monarch by many of her supporters. Largely, the revolutions happen legislatively. So 1850, during the American Revolution, aristocrats run the country, undemocratic. 1832, industrial prosperity makes it so the middle classes start to get brought into the franchise, meaning they can vote. Over the century, the bar to vote gets lower and lower and lower until eventually you get universal manhood suffrage right around World War I. Um, the other piece of this, so political rights help, but money helps more. So the working classes, they start to, they are just beaten down by the Industrial Revolution, as you know. And by the 1850s, the whole country is industrialized. Law, supply, and demand, if you remember from last year. More job, there are less people that are available to work because they're already all working in factories, meaning wages go up. Unemployment is bad for wages. Full employment is good for it. So France is, <laughs> France responds to rising nationalist pressure in the country by basically becoming a dictatorship. <laughs> and so their pride in their nation, their resentment basically after Napoleon gets slapped down by the powers of Europe was to put another Napoleon in charge, who again is Louis Napoleon, who is the first president of the French Republic. He gets 97% of the vote to become an emperor. And, you know, I'm a little skeptical of those numbers, but, you know, he, uh, he changes the country into the modern France that you know now. And so Paris is rebuilt into the beautiful city it is today. Um, infrastructure projects, railroads, sewers, et cetera, et cetera, all paid for by an authoritarian state in which the emperor, who is the gentleman on the left here, controls the police, the army, and the budget. Louis gets captured by Kaiser Wilhelm, who is the gentleman on the right, and in the Franco-Prussian War, the Second French Empire collapses spectacularly. Austria. <laughs> oh, Austria. Austria basically gets its clock cleaned over and over and over again after the revolutions of 1848, right into the First World War, where it is dissolved into nothing. So Austria starts off the 19th century kind of running the show, telling everybody what to do. Then they lose a war against Sardinia Piedmont. Then they lose a war against Prussia. And then they have to basically compromise with the ethnic minorities in their country to prevent further revolution. The Instead of allowing the different nationalities to become, you know, the United States of Austria, if you will, you know, giving the Bohemian, the Czechs their own parliament, the Austrian monarchs decide to just give the Hungarians power. So the yellow territory is the Kingdom of Hungary. The Kingdom of Hungary contains 30 different ethnicities. However, the Austrian government gave just the Hungarians the power to run the parliament. So you end up with a country where you have Germans oppressing about half the ethnicities and Hungarians oppressing the other half. And the only people that are happy are Germans and Austrians, but there's enough power involved that it prevents another revolution. Russia, probably the most autocratic, most authoritarian country in this unit. Um, they're poor, rural. Kings are still seen as absolute monarchs holding divine right of kings. Um, and they use secret police, repression, censorship. 
if you ever have a chance, read some Russian literature. It is some really well-written stuff and really, really bleak. Um, in particular, I'm thinking of uh, Dostoevsky, if you read you know, Crime and Punishment. If you read nothing else, read Crime and Punishment. Uh, Tsar Nic- or, I'm sorry, not Tsar Nicholas, Tsar Alexander II, you know, the conservatives basically deal with the aftermath of the Korean War in 1851 by trying to find solutions. Alexander frees the serfs, meaning basically the Russian slaves, but gives them no money and they continue to starve and then they assassinate him. His son thinks, oh man, I guess giving the peasants freedom was a bad idea and basically locks down Russia even further. This state continues until the Russian Revolution in 1917 and basically liberalism is stifled so much that it ends up turning into communism. The United States starts off as a liberal country. The U.S. Constitution and Bill of Rights are about liberal values. That's what rights are, are liberal values. So the other piece, though, is it's less of a nationalistic nation um, than it is one of many different smaller municipalities, although there's a tension between federalists in the very beginning who want a strong national government and the anti-federalists, and let's be real, who are many of whom are slave owners who are afraid of slavery being abolished in the very beginning of the country. Jackson basically gets rid of all, in his time period, all property qualifications for voting are gone. But again, this is a deeply racist country, with, you know, and this history is deeply racist because only white men count as people. Liberalism grows in the Northeast of the United States along with industrialization as people become wealthier and more educated, and they start to view slavery as a crisis. Oh, this is the Jacksonian presidency. Um, abolitionists basically are the expression of this. They fail to win office. They want a national solution, so a nationalistic solution to slavery. So no slavery expansion throughout the country. Lincoln saying this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free causes South Carolina to secede from the Union. The American Civil War occurs. 600,000 Americans die. But the end result of that is a liberalism victory. So the slaves being forever free. Human rights are liberal values again. And it's a nationalistic victory because the federal government makes it so. This is an image of Fort Sumter where the South betrayed the Union, um, basically having the American flag raised back over it. You can see there were African-American soldiers right in the front of the audience and uh, dignitaries from all throughout the Union. And so the idea of one nation indivisible is kind of the end result of the Civil War. So it's a victory in a lot of ways and if, of liberalism and nationalism and fits into this overall global trend. Canada <laughs> Canada gains its independence by asking nicely. Um, Canadian nationalism more or less has to do with a contrast between the United States and Canada, and that's very rude to a Canadian. But basically, the U.S. fails to conquer Canada in 1812, and that makes Canadians realize, hey, I guess we're not Americans. Upper Canada, which is modern-day Ontario, is English-speaking. Lower Canada is French-speaking. They kind of hate each other. They don't cooperate. Britain forces the two countries, to, or two provinces together to divide and conquer. They want to make these people that hate each other be together. Nonetheless, John McDonald, the Conservative Party leader, basically promises Britain, hey, if you don't give us self-government, we'll go join the U.S. And so the British North American Act of 1867 gives Canada self-rule, and that's still the basis of the government of Canada. And the U.K. still ran their foreign policy, although now Canada does have an independent foreign policy. Canada technically is still part of the British Empire. It's just the British Empire no longer enforces its will on its subjects. So, Canadian independence. 